So the so the foliage was burnt in all the colors of autumn. It was the fall of 2017, and with my recent promotion at my place of work, I often juggled my erratic sleep schedule with copious amounts of caffeine. Um, let's see, give me one second. So I often juggled my erratic sleep schedule with copious amounts of caffeine to manage my work tasks and alleviate my sleep deprivation. My lack of sleep, coupled with other factors, such as life stressors, a previous history of substance use, the rejection of psychiatric help, and a genetic vulnerability to psychosis all began to confluence one another, blurring my sense of reality. While at my work site, suspicions and paranoia snowballed into delusion, delusions and hallucinations. Within a short period of time, I would be hospitalized for an episode of psychosis. While this snapshot of my biography may seem extreme, in retrospect, I identify that the need for self-care for an individual with psychotic symptoms requires particular attention. Though my psychosis, through my psychosis, I was forced to examine how to take exactly uh, better care of myself. Self-care is something that has been getting increased attention in recent years. Though it may be misperceived as a selfish attribute, self-care ensures that we aren't pouring from an empty cup. My objective in this presentation is to examine concepts of self-care particularly as they relate to those with a psychotic condition, while also touching on aspects of self-care pertaining to the mental health professional. At the conclusion, I will offer the effective strategies I have found in the literature and those from my own personal experience to exercise self-care. Reflection on what actually constitutes the self has inspired humankind probably since its inception. Philosophers, spiritual leaders, creatives, and scientists have all striven to understand what the essential components that make up the self actually are. The word schizophrenia translates roughly to the splitting of the mind. Though this diagnostic label is facing some just scrutiny in light of its limitations, while psychotic, I certainly felt a certain breakdown of my ordinary sense of self. As if caught in a changing current of thought, I was charged into a self-centered grandiosity that far outweighed the mundane aspects of my everyday life working within a print shop. My psychotic self was convinced that global celebrities were tweeting direct messages into my neurochemistry, that international intelligence agencies such as the Mossad could be influenced by my psychic energy, and that I had been commissioned to resolve the unsolved murder mysteries that had plagued my community. Though definitely bizarre from the outward observer, my psychosis was also both exhilarating and scary, as it felt as though the balance of the entire world depended upon my decision making. During this time, I was unfit to differentiate the true from the false. In many ways, my ensuing hospitalization was an illustration of the fact that society had ultimately deemed me unable to manage my own self care. In fact, I was personally escorted by the police into an ambulance and taken to an emergency room where an officer was placed outside my door. In recalling some of these details, my intention is simply to illustrate that an individual with a psychotic disorder may have a different perception of what actually constitutes the self. For example, in my hallucinations, I imagined I was communicating, direct, communicating directly with the Holy Spirit or a legion of angels. They had an effective palpability within my being. Though my experiences of psychosis are subjective, however one ends up defining the self, it is undeniable that each of us have needs that we hope to have fulfilled. There are physical, spiritual, social, and psychological needs. A need for sleep, a need for community, a need to love and be loved, a need for food, to be understood, and much more. Self-care is intrinsically connected to these yearnings within the human spirit. Though individuals within our first program may have common themes, labels, or symptoms, each individual who experiences psychosis ultimately experiences it a bit differently. Similarly, our recovery from psychosis may also look different too. There are those who may be in need of a legal guardian and others that live autonomously. Those whose voices go into remission and others, despite dutifully taking their medicine, who still hear voices. 
those that reach the summit of professional accomplishments in their respective field, and those that may face a continuing disability. Obviously, there are infinite number of nuances between these different possibilities. Despite the different manifestations of ourself, our need to understand the world around us and to be understood, to be respected, is an aspect of self-care. Now may be an important time to note that as a peer support specialist, this paper is not written from the perspective of the clinician. Recently, I attended a webinar on the role of the peer support specialist within a clinical team. Here, I was reminded of the critical importance of peer supporters to not fall into the trap of becoming junior clinicians or case managers. That the peer support specialist voice has a particular calling unique to itself that is vital, necessary, and entirely different from the other perspectives on a team of coordinated specialty care. This does not mean, however, that a peer support specialist lives in a self-referential vacuum. And for this reason, I considered it prudent to also review the current trends on self-care found in the literature. While this review was conducted from the perspective of a peer support rather than a clinician, some of the language may be influenced by the nature of the articles being generally written from a clinical perspective. Despite this, my effort is invested in being true to the genuine perspective of a peer support specialist with the lived experience of psychosis. In my review of these articles, it became apparent of the presence of certain obstacles to self-care for those of us with lived experience, one of which related to insight. It seems there are different challenges to having an awareness for one's own psychotic condition. For example, if there is little insight into one's condition, there often corresponds a less active interest in engaging in treatment. However, if there is a greater insight into one's condition, there ensues a pressure to self-stigmatize and a higher risk of suicide. Another obstacle to self-care that I have found in working in the field is often a lack of access to financial resources. Many of my peers have challenges to secure gainful employment, earn competitive wages, and manage their finances. Though individuals that are unable to work may at times obtain social security, these funds do not often fully cover the necessary expenses. Many peers that I've worked with have food insecurity, housing issues, and may lack funds for clothing or recreation. Sometimes the little resources that are available go to support substance use. Though the relief is often temporary, these substances may be used to mask or numb their own symptoms. The symptoms themselves that relate to a psychotic disorder often impede strategies of self-care. For example, one peer that I work with states that his voices tell him not to take his psych meds. Paranoia may even cause something as basic as nutrition to be, to be perceived as a threat. These paranoid thoughts and delusions may lead to a mistrust and a reluctance of forging a therapeutic alliance with the clinician. Well, in a psychotic state, I myself was convinced that my psychiatrist was under the influence of Satan and that his objective was ultimately to thwart my efforts to walk a path of spiritual purity. The negative symptoms of schizophrenia may also be difficult to overcome. Peers that I have interacted with within FIRST may have a tendency toward social withdrawal stifling their social connections. This social isolation may be coupled by a lack of pleasure from previously enjoyed activities or low energy, which discourages other aspects of self-care such as exercise. Many of my peers agree that after the cataclysmic rush of the psychotic experience, there may be an ensuing period of deep depression. In the literature I read, there was also a suggestive evidence of neurocognitive impairment that makes efforts at self-management of the illness all the more difficult. Even if a peer is agreeable to take psychiatric medicine, the side effects themselves may require consideration. For example, antipsychotic medication may influence cholesterol levels, blood sugar, weight gain, and white blood cell count. From my personal experience, I observed that my psych meds have suppressed my energy level and have induced a form of fatigue. My medicine has also increased the cholesterol levels in my bloodstream. Despite these disadvantages, I appreciate the benefits my medicine provides in helping me to curb another episode. Though some of the peers I have worked with claim to experience some relief from the use of drugs and alcohol, for me, they tended to aggravate my symptoms. 
Accepting that I could no longer use these substances has not always been easy. Perhaps I am biased by my own limitations, but from working in the field, I, reg I regularly encounter peers compromising their self-care due to chemical dependency. While total abstinence may not be a realistic proposition for all of those that we work with, I think it is important to be sensitive to the role substances can play in provoking our symptoms. In recognition of your own work with individuals who have experienced the first episode, I hope that you're able to identify with the validity of some of these examples. In the back of your mind though, you may be asking, what about me? What about my self-care? In fact, the role of a mental health professional has been identified as a high risk profession for the neglect of self-care. Vicarious trauma, compassion fatigue, burnout, and counter-transference are all buzzwords that came up in the literature, but we know them firsthand through our own experiences in the field. Without question, there are certainly benefits to our work helping others. This stated at times, it is difficult to not feel despondent in witnessing someone hospitalized or deteriorating, endure homelessness or victimization. Sometimes these experiences remind us of our own human frailty or past memories we would have lever, rather left forgotten. In our field, our very own selves are the instruments that we use to do the work, and the work can be taxing. Despite the acknowledged risks inherent in our field, why are so many of us reluctant to seek out help? What are the barriers that prevent us from reaching out for help? The very help that we often suggest to, in the, to the individuals that we work with. One barrier is our perceived invincibility that we aren't vulnerable to being affected or drained by our work. Another barrier is the stigma of how another mental health professional will receive us given our work in the same field. The cost of treatment and the time involved in treatment are also barriers cited in the literature. Our neglect of personal self-care as mental health professionals has been documented to have negative correlations with the individuals that we're striving to help. Unfortunately, our work environments are not always supportive of our own well-being. Ways to be considered to improve self-care may be in having a wellness room, encouraging the use of PTO, being realistic about having a manageable caseload, and affirming our own mental health counseling, perhaps utilizing it as a form of professional development. The literature suggests that seeing self-care as a preventative measure rather than as a subsequent treatment has been documented to improve outcomes. The effective use of supervision, use of supervision is also a means also to improve our professional practice and our personal outlook. Looking across the spectrum from a mental health professional to an individual with lived experience, there were universal recommendations for self-care. Unanimously supported was the incorporation of mindfulness. Mindfulness meditation has essentially to do with staying in the moment and focusing on the here and now while practicing ways to act in a non-judgmental fashion. Engaging in mindful awareness aids an individual in increasing general awareness of thoughts and emotions and redirecting stress in a productive way. In essence, this is a form of spirituality, which was also documented to advance self-care. Personally, I have found prayer and meditation to be imperative to the maintenance of my wellness. Concerning forms of therapy, the literature re recommended CBTP, a form of cognitive behavioral therapy, specifically tailored for individuals with psychosis to become more implemented. Coordinated specialty care has also been suggested for individual, individuals with psychosis, and this is the general blueprint utilized by our first teams. Personally, I have found that the, dis the distraction tactics suggested by DBT to be helpful interludes during times of increased stress. Essentially, distraction tactics may also be compared to the wellness, wellness tools employed by the RAP method. Having a support group was also so something suggested to me early in my experience receiving mental health care that I have found to be effective. Support groups may be easily found through NAMI, a 12-step group, or simply texting 741-741 and asking them to connect you to resources. Support groups, of course, can be loosely defined and may include family, friends, spiritual guides, caregivers, or romantic partner. Many of my peers have also noted the importance of having a routine. Eating a healthy diet, 
getting enough sleep, working out, and having social connections are important in this respect. Though motivation may be difficult as an attribute to come by for an indiv individual limited by negative symptoms, the research suggests that motivation may be an influencing factor in helping to promote self-care. Ultimately, there is no graduation from self-care. While our practice of self-care may be different or change over time, it is vital for it to be implemented throughout our lifetime. In my continuing treatment, I respect the critical need to practice self-care. Today, I try to consider elements of self-care that ensure that my spiritual, physical, psychological, and social needs are met. Getting over the idea of self-care as being selfish, I understand that my psychotic condition and my work in the mental health field necessarily require me to confront certain limitations and vulnerabilities. The coordinated specialty care model was one that I had the blessing to experience in my first year of recovery. I definitely benefited from the link that the, the, the coordinated links provided for peer support, clinical, medical, and employment connections. It is an honor to work on a team of coordinated specialty care. Thank you for your attention to the importance of practicing self-care and the efforts you make to advance the well-being of those of us with lived experience of psychosis. Thank you.